Before we begin, my good friend Corey put out an excellent 40-minute documentary on the prequel trilogy and the politics of the Senate and that era as a whole. I'm going to link to it in the upper right-hand corner. After you watch this video, go check it out. Let's roll the intro. So over the past couple of weeks on the channel, we spent some time talking about the late Clone Wars, both how the Outer Rim sieges were among the bloodiest months of the war and how the Empire actually launched an extensive campaign against Confederacy holdouts even after the events of Revenge of the Sith. Today, however, we'll be talking about one of the first mega projects the Empire constructed, something that realistically was not feasible under the Republic, and that is the construction of the Super Star Destroyer. Dreadnought class ships were not at all common, even at the height of the Clone Wars. A few very large vessels did exist, for example, the CIS's Subjugator, or more relevantly, the Mandator line used by the Republic, but these paled in comparison comparison to the Super Star Destroyer, and prior to that, both a level of technological sophistication and a thousand years of Rusan era reformations prevented the construction of very, very large, powerful vessels. That history and the prevailing military doctrine of the era made it difficult for Palpatine to facilitate the construction of such massive ships even when he had such a tight hold on the Empire. As both the new essential guide to warfare and other materials explain, the idea of a dreadnought-sized capital ship, i.e. a ship larger than four or five kilometers, received pushback not only from naval traditionalists who saw the Empire's best approach as one which furthered the Republic's strategy of relying on cruisers and star destroyers, but also political offices, budgetary committees, and organs of the Senate. One way that Palpatine got around opposition to what would soon be called the Super Star Destroyer line was simply by lying and obfuscating. The galaxy was a big place, and the Empire, under Palpatine's watch, shifted budgets around and largely constructed Super Star Destroyers in secret. Palpatine also lied not only about the number of Super Star Destroyers which would be produced, as we'll talk about later, but the size of the ships itself. The first type of Super Star Destroyer and the most famous was the Executor class. Within the Empire, it was believed that the Executor would be 8 kilometers long, a secret prototype Executor being built on BIS was 12 kilometers long, while the first fully produced ship of the line, the Executor herself, would be 19 kilometers. In lore, this is meant to show how Palpatine was taking small concessions and building super weapons out of them, but out of universe, this is also an explanation for why throughout Star Wars Legends, Super Star Destroyers sometimes had different sizes, before arriving at the now cited number of 19 kilometers. Notably, the first prototype Super Star Destroyer known as Project Sarlacc was actually destroyed by the Rebel Alliance, and a number of setbacks, delays, and again general opposition seriously lengthened the construction of the Executor and her sister ships. The lead vessel, which was built in the Skarl system before being transferred to Fondor for finishing touches, was not finished until after the Battle of Yavin, despite the fact that Palpatine had planned these ships since months after the end of the Clone Wars. Aside from some small raids and battles, the Executor's first prominent posting was as the flagship for the infamous Death Squadron, which hunted the Rebel Alliance after the Battle of Yavin. The Battle of Yavin is important, I've mentioned it a few times, because part of the reason that the Executor was finished when it was is because Darth Vader wanted a ship which he could guarantee would wipe out surviving Rebels who, at that point, were actually still in a defensive position on Yavin itself. However, the Executor itself was not the only Super Star Destroyer that was produced at this time, and in fact, there were at least four others which were completed soon afterwards, including the Aggressor, the Brawl, which would later become the famous flagship of Warlord Zinj, renamed the Iron Fist, the Reaper, another famous Warlord SSD, this time of Artis Kane, and probably the second most infamous Super Star Destroyer, the Lusankia, which served as a secret prison and which was hidden below the surface of Coruscant. However, these were far from the only Super Star Destroyers the Empire would produce. Alongside the Executor line, the Empire would produce several other Super Star Destroyer designs, 
And as I've shown in a prior video, I can account for at least 40 different Superstar Destroyers which have been named or alluded to, and it's my guess that there were as many as 50 or 60. Superstar Destroyers were often used by the Emperor as a way to reward his most loyal servants. Unsurprisingly, Vader was given command and use of the first Superstar Destroyer, the Executor, and thus was given the most prestige. But from Warlord Zinj in the Quelly Over Sector, to the Dark Lord Jarek's Vengeance class, it seems that one of the main worry of those within the Imperial Navy ended up becoming true. Here's a quote from the Essential Guide to Warfare. Navy traditionals were aghast, fearing that further efforts could bankrupt the Empire. Fleets of patrol boats, frigates, and cruisers struck the traditionalists as much more effective for policing the vastness of space. The Empire already had a vast collection of such warships inherited from the nationalized planetary security forces. To those, it could add the ever-growing number of Star Destroyers, which boasted firepower few could match. To those, battle cruisers and dreadnoughts lumped together under the derisive tag Super Star Destroyer seemed like sops to the bottomless egos and ambitions of moths and Imperial advisors, not pieces of any coherent military strategy. And I'm curious, do you agree that the immense amount of credit spent on SSDs could have been used in a more practical way? Should the Empire have limited it just to the Executor, maybe the Executor and its sister ships, or should it have went the opposite way and built even more Super Star Destroyers and Dreadnoughts? This all of course plays into the Empire's broad military strategy, including the Tarkin Doctrine. While the Star Destroyer alone was more powerful than almost any ship in the Star Wars galaxy, it could be defeated. A Super Star Destroyer was essentially invulnerable. Nothing short of an entire fleet could put a dent to it. That shock and awe the ship provided made the Empire seem invincible, and adherents of the Tarkin Doctrine suggested that it kept systems in line, as would, according to them again, the later Death Stars. But that's the lore, and that is the fictional conflict that existed even within the Empire over the utility of the Executor and other Super Star Destroyers. I want to know all your thoughts down below. And guys, if you want another video to watch, my friend Corey just put out an excellent 40-minute documentary on the Republic Senate, and basically everything you want to know about politics in that era of Star Wars. I'll link to that up above. Till next time, be safe, have a good one, and may the Force be with you.